Thursday? The Thursday? Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Uh, all right. Let us rock and roll. Keep on with the crypto. All right. So, take a few minutes to get back into the swing of things. So, what the heck is cryptography? Okay. E, I think these are 
actually pretty, like, if you just intercepted a message that said this, it seems like the meaning is pretty well hidden, right? But what are some things that are not hidden? systems. Here, Caesar Cipher only has, let's say, 26 options, right, of characters. But what if uh, instead of the alphabet of plain text being just A through Z characters, what if it was, uh, let's say, all possible bytes, so eight bits? 
How many possibilities are there there? 256 possibilities. Yeah, so your key size could be much larger. It may be computation size, and then you also have this problem of how do you know when you found the correct solution? Right, so you're gonna output 256, and then what if I expand the key size more? What if I operate now on 32 bits? How, what's my key space there? Two to the 32? Big number? Something like four billion, something like that? Anybody know? Max, you're the math person, you don't study this stuff. Two to the 32. crypto systems, this is the type of crypto analyst we want to do, or crypto, yeah, so trying to bring a crypto system we want to look at, we should look at, hey, can we just try all possible keys? Because in that case, then we're good to go. We don't have to worry about anything else. Okay, what are other techniques we can try? frequent letter in English, right? So we can use statistics. So going back to our example, so we see that there's three O's in this plain text. Would it make sense to try the, as our very first guess, whatever maps O to Z? No. Why not? Z is not a common letter. Z is probably not a common letter, right? In English, uh, similar with X maybe, we would and then we think of what's likely to have two in a row. It's probably not, you know, we can think of other statistics, right? So we can use those to help guide our search so that we can efficiently look through the search space. So this is going to be, and this is what we're going to look at when we talk about grams. So this is uh, just means letter, like one gram. So just looking at the frequency of one character in English. Okay, cool. So now we have this. What is it? It's breaking right now. What information do you need? What is it? The amount of chips. The amount of chips, and you're looking for the key? Is it a word or a phrase? Is it a word? Is it a phrase? Who knows? How much time do I have? If I, if I have all five, I can break it regardless of all the fourth. It'll just rank all 26? You're free to do whatever you want in class. So if you want to do this, I think that's totally fine. Um, but let's say we want to break it using statistical attacks. How would we go about that? Yeah. Yeah. And what is, does that involve? Does it dictionary? Counting, dictionary, right? Just count. You can go through. This is not. This is something you can do in pen and paper. Right? Much easier, we know how to program. This is why we write programs, so we don't have to do this by hand. So you compute the frequency of each letter in the ciphertext. So in computing frequency, what are we specifically computing? So one thing we can look at is the number, right? The number out of the total, right? Why is that more useful than just the raw number? So if I told you there was, uh, let's say, 25, well, ignoring this ciphertext right here, if I said there's 25 occurrences of the ciphertext letter A, is that useful information? Why? Yeah. Do you think we can compare it to other uh, statistical uh, uses of A and B like uh, any number that has the same rate of appearance as the number that you find is more likely to be that? But why is the rate important? Yeah. Because it could be like a book, and 25 A's is that much. Right. 
So it could be a book's worth of text, in which case 25 A's is maybe could be Z, right? Because it could that can come up depending on if we have uh, you know 100,000 words or something, right? Yeah. You just need to standardize it so you can accurately compare. Right. So we need to standardize it so we can ac accurately compare. So we can do that here. So that's key kind of hidden in this word frequency, right? Is the occurrence of the letter divided by the size, the number of letters in your cipher text. So I'm highly confident you can all do this. You can even write a program to do this. So if we look at something like this, we can say, well, and this, and then, you know, here we're ordering it by frequency. So it should be the case that the most frequent letter is B, and then E, and then Q, U, J, F, so on. Is that right? I think P, H, L. No, we, we like this way? Right. And then what do we do? Yeah, so compared to, and I'd say even at a higher level, right? So this, we're, it's clear we're making the assumption that this is English characters, right? If this was a different language, we'd need to treat it differently, right? So we're using some information about what we think the language is. there in the frequency of words, of course, in each of the definitions of each word, you would have, like, that would probably reveal something. Um, so in some sense, it kind of depends on what the language is in some sense, right? So you could use, uh, people talk about books, you can get um, free text books through, what's that common thing I'm thinking of? You know? Do you know? Yeah, Project Gutenberg has a bunch of, uh, that are out of intellectual property. So they're open um, source, not source, open rights. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say. Uh, another good thing to consider is what is this site where I'm trying to break and compare it to something else that's similar. If this thing I am trying to break the site of is a dictionary, I'll just do it if I want to. Comparing it to a dictionary is going to be good, but then if this is like a letter, maybe you guys can go and find examples of letters on the internet and read that. Right. Great. So great example. So what? So there are, you know, what you're trying to do is essentially build this frequency based off of signals, right? So all you used was Charles Dickens books, which you can use. They're free online. You can find them, right? Um, but the language is maybe more modern English. What would maybe be some problems there? Yeah. Yeah, so if we have known plain text, right, and this is actually what when we study, I mean, talking about in historical context in war, 
they obviously have to know the target language, right? So you need to know like slang that they use, like uh, any other type of stuff. Um, but yeah. Do you know who it's from? Can we like dig up old text in Britain? Like if it's Caesar and Plato's speeches? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if it's, yeah, that'd be great. So we could send scribes to Caesar's speeches or the letters that he writes, and we could use those to get frequencies. Yeah, these are all great because we're now tailoring our attacks specifically to an individual in the context that we care about. Cool. Okay, so you can create this. This is not a um, fantasy made kind of. This is just handed down. You could actually calculate this stuff if you wanted to. Yeah. So uh, I have a question. Yep. Does this apply um, no matter how large the sample text is, or does it be like sufficiently large? Interesting. So yes and no, maybe both. Okay. It's it's. Uh, We'll look at different measures we can use to kind of, in some sense, test that. So you can think of the problem is basically like a statistics problem, right? So here we have some letters, right, that were drawn originally from the English alphabet in the form of words, right? And now we're looking at those ciphertexts, but how many letters is this? Can anybody count really quick? What, 25, maybe 30 letters? So, and depending on what they're talking about, if they're talking a lot about xylophones and other types of things, right? Our, yeah, 32 characters here. So yeah, our guesses may be wrong, so we have to keep that in mind because there's errors and bias in here. So we need to try to keep refining down to what, uh, what we can. Yeah. Words in here. Well, it's just like really cryptic slang. 
<laughs> you have massive problems. Okay, 13. What happens if you're shipped at 13? Yeah, so we shift like halfway basically. Every third letter of the number 
I mean, okay. Sorry, this number. Talk about this really quick right now. Okay, so what were some of the problems with the Caesar cipher? So we can guess it really easily? Yeah. So then, what other problems does this have then? So one thing, we can just brute force all the keys. What else? Yeah. Um, it doesn't like obfuscate what the original alphabet was? Yeah, so it doesn't. So we think about that, um, I don't like to think about it in terms of graph, right? We look at that graph of English frequency characters. All we're doing is shifting that graph one way or the other, right? But that graph, those frequencies still remain in the remaining text. Yeah. I guess I'm not going to the lengths of the same inventory. The lengths? Yeah, so length of the plain text is uh, still the same, although you do have some problem of like, how you go back into the length. If you make it bigger, that's fine, but where did, those, where did that information come from? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can break it very quickly because of the statistical. So the other idea is that statistical frequencies are not concealed very well. So, what if we made the key bigger? How do we make the key bigger? can let's say be as many letters as we want. So let's say it's three letter long key and we just keep repeating the key and then we shift every first, uh, the first letter of the ciphertext by the first letter of the key, that many amounts. We shift the second one by the second key, the third by the third of the key, and then the fourth by the first of the key. We'll see an example of this very quickly. Essentially, the idea is smooth out the statistical frequencies. So smooth out that, so that instead of just shifting this whole um, statistical frequencies in one direction or the other, let's smooth it out to make it more difficult. Uh, okay, now I will try to pronounce this correctly. I checked with somebody who's from France. Uh, Dijonaire cipher is where I land on this. So again, a person's name in France who came up with this. The idea was similar to Caesar cipher, but used a phrase or a word as the key. So we'll look at an example. So we have the boy has the ball. I know, a really great message that we need to send. The key, let's case, and this is B-I-G. So essentially, what we're going to do is encode, so we still use the Caesar cipher essentially for each letter, but now instead of just shifting the alphabet once, we have, we're shifting the alphabet three different ways. So if we had B-I-G, 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 the boy has the ball. So we have the plain text, the boy has the ball. We essentially can think of it as repeating the key over and over. And so we're going to shift the first one by how much? B. 
Say we need to break it. What do we need to know? The length of the repeating. So we need the length of the key, right? Do we assume we know that? No. No, because we don't know the key. We don't really know anything about the key. But it could be any length. I mean, to a certain amount, yeah. So if it's shorter than the length of the cipher, do you just like mentally repeat it? Yes. Okay. So the key is repeated over and over again. And so that way, you think of it as a modulo, right? So it just keeps going over, shifting each letter of the plain text with the corresponding letter of the key. Yeah? Well, the fact that there has been uh, two repeat open gays mean that uh, we can assume that if we're breaking into it, there is a repetition in the plain text. Yeah, so that's something interesting we can look at, right? So we can see this OPK, OPK. Let's think about this for a second. Um, pause that. Uh, let's think about, so we have the period, the length of the key. So then let's think about how does this affect our brute forcing. So how long is it going to take to brute force a one letter key? How many guesses? 26. Same with the Caesar cipher, right? So uh, the vision and error cipher is more complicated than a Caesar cipher, or encompasses the Caesar cipher within it, right? OK, what about two? So two characters. 26 squared, uh, three characters, cubed, four characters. At some point, do you want to stop brute forcing? 
Yeah, I mean, it depends on how much hardware you have and how what your budget is, but at a certain point, it's going to be unfeasible to brute force these keys, which is actually something that's really cool to think about, right? This was created, I believe, I don't know, I'm just going to make up an, uh, all, before computers. I know that's definitely true. I can say that. Um, so you can think about it, it's very, and you could do this with pen and paper, right? This encryption scheme, right? And you, you, you could easily use up to a, like a five digit key or a five key of five length. It could be a word or whatever you want it to be. That'd be something that would e be easy to transmit, but you get, you would increase the key space to uh, 26 to the fifth. Is that what we said? Can somebody do that number? Is that a large number? It's a small number. 26 to the fifth. How large? How many? 12 million? 12 million? Yeah, let's add another one, six. You can do six one, I'm sure that makes it slightly bigger, right? And so now you're in the range of it's difficult to brute force even in computers, right? If you had 10, 26 to the 10th is pretty large. You keep going and you'd have an encryption scheme and a crypto system that you can do by hand that is difficult to brute force through the key space. It's kind of crazy, right? So, okay. So we have the period with the length of the key. Uh, and we know that the key has different letters. So we're going to talk about this in a second. This term will make sense in a bit. But we know each the key has different letters. We don't know exactly how many. OK, so how can we attack this? Are we, so we know, what, what do we know won't work? Let's go through. It's sometimes helpful to explore the negative space. What type of things won't work? The type of statistical analysis we used before, right? With one gram, specifically the one gram English frequencies, you can think of that is going to be smoothed out. So what do I mean by smoothed out? Right? All those letters are going to kind of go towards each other to some average. Okay, we can't do that. What else can we do? Could you could you still do statistical analysis if you were to say like statistical analysis on every third letter and then group all the third letters and then run an analysis and then Yeah, so the one thing that we do know is we know that we don't necessarily know the key length to start. Right? But if we assume we know it, right? Let's say it's length n. Right? We could take Actually, I hate using n. Let's take three, right? Let's do a key length of three. You could take the first, the fourth, everything, mod uh, three, whatever, n mod three equals zero. Take all of those. So let's let's go through an example. split it up into, and now you can think of this as three different alphabets, right? Why? So assuming 
assuming that we're correct, we know the period, we know the period is three of the key. Why can we think of these as three different alphabets? They were all shifted by the exact same letter, right? We don't know what that is, but we know this is like key zero, key one, and key two, right? All of the characters in this alphabet were shifted by the exact same amount, right? So now, what does that remind us of? Caesar cipher, right? Each of these was shifted by the exact same amount. It means that the statistical frequency here is still going to match English. What are some of the difficulties, though? Yeah. Yeah, so we've cut the samples we have in thirds, right? That's one problem. What's another problem? Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay, so that's definitely a problem. Yeah. Okay, let's ignore that for now. Yeah, we still need to figure out the length. It's definitely still a problem. Yeah. Well, I feel like the fact that it's not really true English anymore, it's like split, it won't follow the same statistics. Yeah, so how do we know when we get it right? So let's say we run our analysis on each of these, we get different. This says try uh, 10, 5, and then 20. Right, when we were doing that on this small example, it took us two tries to get the correct answer. So how do we know if we've shifted key zero correctly? Yeah? Okay, so like you have to compute all of them. So you have to like meet your k, k0, k1, and k2. Try all the possible k2s and like maximize that by the way. Maximize every single k1, maximize every single k0. So that's like already like three extra levels, two extra levels of time. Right, the key problem here is that all these are related, right? which is exactly what you've all been saying, right? So these keys are related, the letters are related essentially like this, right? So, but if we just shift one, uh, if we just shift and try to guess the first letter, we won't know if we're correct because we only have a third of the alphabet. So how can we tell if our guess is actually correct? So we need to have some way to think about that or deal with that. <coughs> so that? Yeah, so now it gets more difficult. Or can get more difficult, right? I think mean, you could try like the first five iterations of each one, so then you're doing like five to the third as opposed to like 26 to the third. Yeah, so we can maybe search, reduce our search space of the keys that are more likely to occur. Yeah. Are we assuming we're in like early France now? No. Where you have to memorize the key? Because it's possible it could be a common phrase, so then you cut down combinations. Yeah, so that's an interesting thing. So why does that matter? So we said that the key space was two to the or twenty-six to the third in this case. Right. So if we're going to brute force the key space, and we know it's let's say three characters, um, we could make an assumption. Do we think that they memorize the key? Like, is it a word or is it completely random? If it's truly random, then how many keys do we have to test? All of them, right? 26 to the third. We'd have to enumerate every possible key. If we think it's likely that it's a word, what would we have to do? Just try all the three-letter words. Try all the three-letter words. How many three-letter words are there in English? Can we scramble a lot? Less than 26 to the Probably less than 26 to the third. I'd say that you can easily verify that that's true. Probably significantly less. Right? So this is, uh, now we're getting into this interesting thing about breaking the key itself by making assumptions of how it was generated. So if it wasn't generated in a purely random way, then maybe we'll have problems. Uh, we'll because the more difficult scenario is something that is completely generated randomly, that's kind of what we want to focus on. So that there's no, no uh, Yeah, that would, that yeah, so what does that give you? So let's say, let's say you have uh, 
what we can just do is take what's the difference between O minus T? I mean, spoiler, it's going to be V or whatever 26 minus V is. And we can take H to P, it'll be I, and then G. We can do this again, V, I, G. So this is why we characterize the different types of attackers in different terms of different capabilities, right? So specifically for this crypto system, in the case of a um, just a known plain text attacker, your scheme is completely broken because they can trivially derive the key from having both the plain text and the cipher text. Everyone agree with that? Cool. So the more difficult case is then what if we don't have the plain text, right? Ten way attack. Cool. Okay. Okay, cool. So we have some kind of approach here, right? We actually have an approach that we can start to take. We've talked about some of the difficult things, but this is all hinged on actually getting the period, right? So we then need some way to get the period and figure out the length of this key. Cool. So you just came up with this. How to break this, yeah. Just letters here in this one. 
Those are just letters. So because our alphabet is remember A through Z. So there's nothing, no spaces, no punctuation. We'll assume the other person knows our intent from the message. Repetition anywhere? Why? Because uh, the, the length of the repeating um, like string would uh, give you the length of the period. Hmm. Yeah, so let's think about this for a second. So why can't we use repeating characters? So what do we know about those three O's in the upper right? Zero or O O O. Yeah. I mean they're all probably Right, they're all probably mapped. The plain text has those different characters. It just so happens that they map to O O O, right? And so the fact we can't necessarily say anything about those O and this O and this O because we don't know anything about that. Let's go back to our original cipher here. So going, thinking a little more about this idea of repetition. So what repetitions do we see here in this cipher text? OPK. 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 So we have OPK and OPK. Is that it? Is it possible that we see 
between OP and OP here that don't have the same corresponding plain text? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, why? You nod your head vigorously. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's also likely that somehow it got sandwiched at a different point in the text. Yeah, it just happened to be that this T8 or that some other letters were somewhere else on the key and that the key happened that like the key shifted the alphabet such that it output an OP. Right? So the fact that there's a repetition, but how likely is that to happen with three characters in a row or four characters in a row? Right? Less and less likely to happen. So what can we do? So then we say, what's the difference between this OP game and this OPK? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we say the key is length nine. What do we actually use with this information? Uh, it has to be multiple of the different ways get it. Yeah, it's likely. I would say it has to, right? Like it's likely that it's some multi the key is some multiple of nine. So what type of things could we check for then? Three, twenty-seven. Yeah, three, twenty-seven. It could be any number of things, right? This at least gives us something to start with. And heck. This is something we had with, uh, what's this, uh, 12, no, that's not right, uh, 15 characters, <laughs> yeah. And then we also know that uh, the period is bounded by the length of the string. Hmm. Yeah, we can definitely assume that the, uh, that the key length, because the key was the exact same size as the message, uh, you still have to, you had to communicate that key to them at some point, so why don't you just give them that message then or whatever, like, <laughs> we'll go into that. Okay, so what repetitions are there in this ciphertext? No. Actually. Cool. So, yeah, this is actually all the stuff we just talked about, right? So, that repetitions in the ciphertext are likely to occur when characters with the key appear over the same characters in the plain text, right? It's not the guarantee, but that's a very likely scenario. So, in this exact example we had, so it could be, you know, the distance is nine, it could be less than nine, it could be more than nine, like we talked about, one, three, or nine. So let's look at this here. What repetition do we have? here. 
this, right? We write down the distance. We can look through all of these, so the start, the end, the distance, and calculate all the factors, right? So, so based on this chart, what would we start looking at first? What was that? Two and three seem pretty common. What do we look at? Two or three? What do we have to look at? Yeah, so find back. So you do two, three, maybe six. Um, what of, so this gives us a nice overview, right? But, I mean, should we, we uh, should we be worried about this like QO that's like seven and seven, or the MI that's, or the OO that's just as five? Why not? Yeah. I feel like the one is two. close that alphabet is to English. Very little. So it, it actually would probably maybe be easier in that sense. 
shifts, we start trying to brute force and guess the different shifts, but our period is incorrect. We will never get the correct key. Yeah? What's the intuition of doing like two times variables? Like we just like look at it and go, oh, these two numbers look good. You wouldn't want to use four. Why would you want to use four? Yeah, it's not a multiple of, of uh, the biggest one, right? Yeah. So it's, it's four. Four thirty. Yeah. So um, ideally, you have a pretty easy way of checking this period, like the checking of the guests that we'll talk about next, and so you could run these for them and see very clearly which one it is. It pops out pretty easy. Um, so we're going to introduce a new statistical measure. And this measure is going to be called the index of coincidence. So the nice thing is, so the idea is that if we choose randomly two letters from, from the ciphertext, what's the likelihood that they're the same letter? So if the text is completely random, what's that likelihood? What was it? 126. Yeah, 1 over 126. Uh, wait, what? 1 over 26, yeah. right? So it should be, that would be completely random. You pick one letter, you pick another letter. The odds that they're the same, they're completely random letters. Um, if it's English, is it going to be completely random? No, because you now know how random distribution, right? The distribution is through English. You can calculate over English text what that likelihood is. And as you choose different periods, this, so you can think of completely random on one side, a period of one, which is English text, is where English is. As you get closer and closer, you'll get closer to that index of coincidence. So it's actually pre-calculated for different size periods. So this actually gives one guess that kind of helps you a little bit. Um, all right, I guess we're going to get back to this. Tuesday, but 